And now it's time for the honorable mention. For the best of stop motion, it would seem kind of difficult to choose which one to talk about, considering I have a large selection of things that I could mention. I could get into the holiday specials of Rankin Bass, popular TV shows like Robot Chicken, or projects related to a stop motion artist, like Henry Selleck and his involvement with Wes Anderson's The Life Aquatic of Steve Zissou. But in reality, the choice was actually quite easy. Considering that I talked about stop motion as a special effect, like the works of Ray Harryhausen, then I have to talk about the biggest monster in cinema history. Not necessarily literally, but definitely figuratively. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I am going to show you the greatest thing your eyes have ever beheld. He was a king and god in the world of cinema, but now comes to you here, merely a captive, to gratify your curiosity. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you King Kong, the eighth wonder of the world. It's the story of documentary filmmaker Carl Denham, who brings his crew and an actress named Anne Darrow to set sail to the mysterious Skull Island. While there, they find that the island is filled with dinosaurs, dangerous natives, and a thing that they worship called Kong which turns out to be a giant gorilla. The natives went and kidnapped Anne so she could be a sacrifice to Kong, but it turns out that the ape actually likes her. Suddenly, Carl and the crew came back to rescue Anne and even bring Kong to New York so he could be one hell of a show on Broadway. But now that things aren't working well for the show, Kong is on the loose in New York City so he could find his one true love. Filmmaker Marion C. Cooper was always fascinated by apes and wanted to make a movie with them. When he read W. Douglas Burden's The Dragon Lizards of Komodo, he envisioned an idea of what could make a great movie, which would include a gorilla that fights off Komodo dragons, a woman because the critics keep saying that there's no romance in Cooper's films, and would result in an amazing death scene in New York City. When he suggested this to Paramount Movies, they got scared and said no, fearing that it would be too expensive to send a film crew to someplace like Africa or Komodo to make a movie this epic. It didn't help either that this was the time when the Great Depression began. Afterwards, he was brought into RKO in order to work on The Most Dangerous Game, which was directed by his friend Ernest Schoedstack, and he met two of the stars of the film, Robert Armstrong and Faye Ray. While there, he went to check on a fantasy movie that was really going out of hand in production called Creation and met the special effects wizard Willis O'Brien and discovered his ability to bring dinosaurs to life using stop motion. This gave Marion a great idea for his gorilla movie to be both cheaper and more epic. Instead of Komodo dragons, he'll just use Willis's stop motion dinosaurs. Instead of being filmed in Africa, he'll just film in a jungle set that's all ready for shooting. And for the gorilla, he'll make him giant and call him Kong, while his death will be falling from the Empire State Building. So after a bit of negotiation, Marion convinced RKO to make his movie and stop production on creation. By the way, that wasn't the only reason why RKO greenlit the project. You see, back in the early 20th century, jungle movies were really big, rather they be documentaries or dramas where a scientist made a huge discovery. But what's even more popular were jungle movies with monkeys and apes, since very few zoos have them on display. But then came the 1930 Igangi, a black exploitation film disguised as a documentary where it depicted a black woman having sex with a gorilla and gave birth to an ape. It was no surprise that it was very controversial, but it was also one of the highest grossing films of the 30s, earning more than $4 million. So the idea of another movie with a gorilla and a pretty lady really sweetened the deal for RKO. Throughout the writing, there were several people that came in to write the film. It was going to be done by Edgar Wallace, but he passed away while working on it. This was followed by James A. Creelman and Horace McCoy to try to finish up the script. But then came Ruth Rose, the wife of Ernest Shodstack. She wrote a more complete and cleaned up version of the script that Cooper approved. One of the things she did was that she based some of the characters on the people she knew. Carl Denham was based on Cooper, 
Jack Distrel mirrored Ruth's husband, Ernest, and Anne Darrow was inspired by Rose herself. Also, Kong was originally going to escape from Madison Square Garden, but then it changed to the Yankee Stadium, then finally in a Broadway theater. When casting Anne Darrow, Marion went back to see Fay Ray and asked her, Say, Torch, how would you like to be next to the tallest, darkest man in Hollywood? You mean Cary Grant? Oh, ho, ho, much taller than Cary, and much darker, too. Oh, my. Is he also rugged? Uh, you can definitely say that, yeah. When it came to directing, both Ernest and Marion had a bit of a hard time working together, since their styles are more different to one another. What they decided to do is that they'd be in charge of different parts of the movie. Ernest would work on the live action scenes, while Marion would direct the stop motion scenes with Willis O'Brien. Like I said before, the sets were all ready for shooting. This was because they were originally made for previous films, like The Jungle was made for The Most Dangerous Game, The Native Huts were from Birds of Paradise, and The Wall was originally from Cecil B. DeMille's The King of Kings. The entire time to film the movie took a total of 8 months. It took so much time that the actors even had time to go and work on more movies. One interesting note is that the original Kong doesn't really have a specific height. They went with a 1 inch equals 1 foot idea and made an 18 inch model of Kong. But Marion wanted Kong to be bigger when he's in New York, so they made another model, this time in 24 inches. So, I guess the safest answer to Kong's height is around 20 feet tall? Before they were filmmakers, Marion and Ernest were, at one point, wrestlers. This actually helped out when it came to working on the fighting scene with the T-Rex versus Kong. In order to make the actors look like they were in the world of the stop-motion beast of Willis O'Brien, they had to invent a combination of ideas to make it work. Sometimes they had to film the actors in front of a rear projector with a life-size head and arms of Kong. Sometimes they have to go and mix the footages, and sometimes they had to add clips of the actors in the background and change them frame by frame while working with the stop-motion puppets. While the film was close to completion, it spanned a total of 13 reels. Since Marion was superstitious, he added one more scene where Kong destroyed an elevated train because, when Cooper was a kid, an elevated train would always keep him up at night. Well, whatever unleashes your anger, I suppose. However, even with that addition, there are known to be some deleted scenes taken away from the original cut. One was a scene where Kong shakes some sailors off a log into a pit of giant spiders, which was taken out because it traumatized test audiences. Then there was one where Kong was looking for Anne in New York, and he picks up a different woman. When he figured out it wasn't her, he literally just tossed her aside. But don't worry, it doesn't matter, she's not Anne. And then there was an overhead shot of Kong falling from the Empire State Building. This was removed because it didn't look as good as the producers hoped for. When looking closely at the plane that shot down Kong, the flight commander is actually Marion himself while Ernest was the observer. I mean, who else would you get to kill off Kong other than the directors themselves? Anyways, while the movie was in production, executive producer David O. Selznick left RKO. Before leaving, however, he wrote a memo to change the name of the movie from Kong to King Kong. The film opened on March 2nd, 1933 in New York at two of the biggest theaters, the Roxy and Radio City Music Hall, with sold out performances at every screening. It wasn't until March 23rd that it had its world premiere at Grauman's Chinese Theater in Hollywood, with the big head bust used in the movie on the foreground. It earned great praise from critics saying that King Kong explores the soul of a monster, making audience scream and cry throughout the film, in large part due to Kong's breakthrough special effects. And you know who else loves this movie? HITLER! And you know what that means, right? It means that he really appreciates the artistry of the film. It's also been said that another favorite of his is Walt Disney's Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Anyways, the movie managed to earn $90,000 on its opening weekend, which was the biggest opening of its time, and made a total of $2 million at the box office, which saved RKO from bankruptcy. 
It was so successful that some claim that this is the first ever re-released film in 1938. It returned to theaters several times afterwards, like in 1942, 1946, 1952, and 1956, increasing its performance to $4 million domestically. A few months after the release of King Kong, a sequel was immediately made called Son of Kong, which wasn't as successful as its predecessor, but still was a hit. Many years later, Willis O'Brien originally wanted to make a movie where Kong fights off one of Dr. Frankenstein's monsters. What happened was that Toho decided to step in, replace Frankenstein with their monster, Godzilla, and turn it into the 1962 Godzilla vs. King Kong. Five years later, Toho made another movie with the giant gorilla called King Kong Escapes, where he faces off with Mechanic Kong. It's been said that the movie is loosely based on the animated Rankin-Bass series. But then in 1976, Paramount Pictures released a modern remake of King Kong directed by John Gielman where the stop motion was replaced by a more advanced gorilla suit, and Kong climbs up the World Trade Center instead of the Empire State Building. It got some mixed reviews, but it was still successful with $90 million at the box office and won an Oscar for Best Visual Effects, while being nominated for Best Cinematography and Best Sound. In 1984, the movie was released as part of the Criterion Collection on Laserdisc, containing the first ever audio commentary. But then two years later, a sequel to the remake was released called King Kong Lives, where Kong actually survived the fall, but needs a blood transfusion. But where can they get all that blood? Well, who else but King Kong's girlfriend? Oh, no, 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 not her. This lady. Yeah, they call her Lady Kong. So after the operation was a success, they both escape, make a baby, and then the same crap happens. I'm just saying, I haven't seen this movie, but just by hearing the summary of the plot alone makes me go in disbelief that I live in a world where a thing like this actually exists. Unsurprisingly, that movie bombed both critically and financially. But on a brighter note, in 1988, Universal Studios Hollywood added the King Kong encounter as part of their studio tour. It was so groundbreaking and became such a hit with guests that they had to make another one for Universal Studios Florida called Kongfrontation. In 1991, the Library of Congress added King Kong to be a part of the United States National Film Registry for being culturally, historically, and aesthetically significant. In 1998, Warner Brothers released a direct-to-video animated musical of the film called The Mighty Kong, which includes songs written by the Sherman Brothers. Why doesn't anyone talk about it? Well, maybe the fact that it's as good as those dumb Disney sequels could explain it? But then, in 2005, Peter Jackson, who was fresh out of the Lord of the Rings trilogy, made a more fateful remake of King Kong with Jack Black as Carl Denham and Naomi Watts as Anne Darrow. The movie did better than the last remake with more positive reviews, earning $550 million and won three Oscars for Best Sound Mixing, Best Sound Editing, and Best Visual Effects. Jackson loved the original movie so much that he even recreated the deleted giant spider scene by making it the same way as they would back then in the early 30s. But then on June 1st, 2008, tragedy struck at Universal Studios Hollywood. A massive fire broke out on the studio tour and completely took down the King Kong lot. The only solution that Universal has for this is to rebuild it, bigger and better. So with the help of Peter Jackson and the crew of the 2005 remake, they made King Kong 360 3D. On June 15, 2013, a stage musical was made based on the film in Melbourne, Australia, and the result is said to be a lot similar to the 1976 remake, where the effects and the look of the show? Amazing! The writing? Not so much. 
As for the original movie, it has been named one of the greatest films of all times by many, including the American Film Institute, who put the film on many of its lists, including number 12 on its 100 thrills, number 13 on its film scores, number 4 on its top 10 fantasy films, and number 43 on its top 100 movies, and number 41 on the list's 10th anniversary. To this day, King Kong has been known to be an icon of motion picture history and will be forever known as a true cinema classic. In conclusion, not only is stop motion an underrated animation medium, but it is also a tool that helps shape how movies are today. With the ability of taking inanimate objects and bring them to life, it helped spark the minds of many filmmakers in order to make movies they thought it would be impossible to make. It helped brought to life dinosaurs, skeletons, mythical creatures, and lovable characters to the big screen in a way that the world has never seen. Although that nowadays technology has grown a lot more advanced and now movies are using nothing but CGI, it's all thanks to stop motion that we had 3D animation since the very beginning, and even the medium itself is working with technology in order to grow in the field of animation. And now, to finish things off, I'm going to count down the top 10 stop motion animated films. And by the way, I'm only counting the fully animated ones. The ones that use as a special effect, they don't really count. Here we go, number 10, Frankenweenie, number 9, Corpse Bride, number 8, Paranorman, number 7, Fantastic Planet, number 6, Mary and Max, number 5, Coraline, number 4, Fantastic Mr. Fox, number 3, Wallace and Gromit, The Curse of the Were-Rabbit, number 2, The Nightmare Before Christmas, and number 1, Chicken Run. Well, that's all I've got for the best of stop motion. Join me next time, and we'll be taking a bus trip to Japan. See you later, dudes!